Hey there, folks. This is Jay Frost uh, from obviously uh, Technology Central, or more seriously, from the Philanthropy Mastermind series, brought to you by our friends at Donor Search. And as usual, we won't be talking much about Donor Search today, although I want to say two things about them at least. The first is that they've provided a platform for having conversations with the kinds of guests we are going to have on our screen in just a moment, uh, and, and many others, uh, I think now 250 since 2017 in over uh, 450 programs, uh, podcasts, webcasts, and CFRE accredited webinars like today's. And that's all because they've said, go ahead, have fun, and, uh, and interact with people in the profession around the world. So I want to thank them for that and thank you for being a part of it as well as we go into well into our eighth year of programming. Now, in addition to doing that little shout out, I want to make sure that you know you can participate today as well. So uh, you want to make sure that you can make full use of the chat, and I see some of you are already doing that, so thank you for that. Do participate actively there. We really do want you to use that as a sandbox for you to play. We also have a Q&A section you can see on your screen as well. We'd love it if you would utilize that to ask your questions so that I can share those with our presenter, and then he can answer those in due course. So again, have a conversation, ask your questions throughout. We want to make sure you are a part of this. We can't see or hear you, but we do want to hear from you. And so with that, I want to welcome onto the screen, if you can still hear me out there, our friend, Ryan Gennard. <laughs> Hi, Ryan. Thanks so very Hi, much for being here. Um, no and it is very early where you are. I know I keep reminding you of that, which isn't fair, but I want the audience to know, since you are coming here um, to us from Australia, uh, it's um, a little after, well, 6.35 in the morning. Is that right? Yeah, it's, uh, well, it's tomorrow. So me being in the future is very on brand. So uh, no, but happy to come and uh, speak about this important topic. <laughs> right. And we are going to be talking today in case you're wondering what this is about and you just happen to be here out of good fortune. Today's topic, of course, is um, this issue about uh, uh, recruiting and coaching your winning team. Um, but that money ball principle, which is what you are going to be sharing with us. And if you're not familiar with the book or the movie, um, well, shame on you, but I'm sure you'll learn more about it now. Data is central to what we do in development, but it's not always used terribly well and certainly not in the area of recruitment and retaining talent. And there's nothing more important than, of course, uh, having a team that works for you and works for them as well. So we'll be talking about that today. Uh, Ryan, of course, has his CFRE. As you saw on the screen a moment ago, he's the head of advancement for the Australian National University. He's the founder of Fundraise for Australia, and he's also the author, as he put it, on point of uh, future fundraising. So for all those reasons, it's really a pleasure to have him. And what I will do is step back now and, Ryan, let you share a little bit, and then we can begin the conversation. So take it away. No, thanks for the stage, Jay, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to have a chat. So um, yeah, we're going to really talk about kind of uh, fundraising in and uh, you know through the lens of how do we recruit that next generation of fundraisers. So I talk uh, a lot about talent in one of the pillars of my book, Future Philanthropy: uh, The Tech Trends and Talents Defining New Civic Leadership. And something that really has resonated with a lot of folks that have read the book is the pillar of talent. I think we're uh, understanding that yeah, we had a lot of fancy tech out there, and that is really inspiring. Uh, kind of the work we're doing. Uh, basically through that lens of futurism, like what is it going to look like in the next 10 years? But we're going to need people to get us there. And I've seen a lot of uh, kind of memes or quotes about, you know, AI isn't going to take your jobs, but someone with AI uh, that, that understands AI is. And I kind of understand that, um, but disagree with it because I feel that we're still in control of uh, the work we do. And uh, when we're in control of the work we do, we're also in control of the people that we hire and the teams that we build. Uh, so in terms of the Moneyball uh, uh, thesis, um, you would have seen the movie, as Jay mentioned, uh, the one with Brad Pitt in there. But I think that um, we have misrepresented it. I've seen a lot of people have those titles in a lot of webinars and stuff, but they've been looking at the data through, uh, again, through tech. And there's kind of tech arrogance out there at the moment. They can solve all our ills. But uh, if you kind of sit and watch the movie for what it is, it's building the best team with uh, and kind of doubling down on people's strengths, uh, making sure that the weaknesses are lifted up. And again, you're building a team. So um, I, when I build teams here at the ANU, I look for the shortfalls in my own skill set. Um, I have dyslexia, so I'm not very bad at getting to meetings and very uh, uh, kind of I need nudges all the time. 
So I get people that are slower, that aren't running a million miles an hour, that are analytical, that can inform my decision making. So again, kind of, uh, again, that awareness is important. So uh, identifying talent is one thing, but being aware of uh, how and why you recruit them is another. Um, so again, uh, the, the thesis is pretty simple. Um, you know, it's uh, it comes from small uh, market baseball teams that really were using analytics to, again, build the team and build teams to win. Um, we, we've seen it with the Kansas City Royals, right? Um, that one of the most recent examples I, I'm a San Diego Padres fan, so that was kind of true until the past couple of years where money has been, but I'm sure data did inform uh, that recruitment as well. So um, given that framing, I'll jump into a presentation if I'm able to share my screen now, so bear with me, everyone. And I'm assuming everyone can see it. So um, again, kind of structured a bit more here for the conversation. So this is what I, I'm going to be sharing uh, probably for the next uh, 20 or 30 minutes before we get into a broader conversation. So understanding tomorrow's job market. Again, what are those jobs of the future? Uh, again, a lot of my work is looking 10 years into the future and deconstructing in a way where we understand it now and we can start making moves now to uh, really take advantage and bring the nonprofit sector into kind of that uh, leader of ideas, not as a um, kind of uh, end user that we've seen with a lot of the tech. So we see a lot of the commercialization with uh, trends in the field. And that also uh, lends itself to recruiting as well. And unfortunately, uh, we're the, the last kind of revenue vertical, as it were. We need to understand the work now so we can work arm in arm with the people that are building uh, a lot of the stuff. So again, what does that job market look like? Again, professionalization, uh, professionalization of the sector. This is something I'm becoming very, very passionate about and doubling down on my kind of own work. We'll probably talk about um, a organization that I founded when I moved back to Australia called Fundraise for Australia and how we're identifying uh, folks and encouraging them to become fundraisers. Uh, so but professionalization is going to be key there to, again, attract uh, more robust talent and keep them uh, learning along their career. So we don't see that 16 months uh, you know, figure that keeps on uh, glaring uh, itself on every social media page uh, when it comes to retaining talent. And uh, then go, again, identify ways to empower your staff because um, I am more of a participatory leader. So I know when to lead, but um, the thing that really gets me moving is, uh, you know, linking arms with my staff and, um, you know, moving forward together, growing together. But most importantly, knowing when to get out of the way giving them uh, the roadmap for success and uh, then seeing them execute and helping them do that. So that's what we're going to kind of go over uh, briefly. So again, I'm a, a, a rule of three kind of person. So I like kind of building platforms and pillars. So that's how we're going to uh, frame this discussion. So acquire, this is the front end, right? So this is, um, the market is what it is. Um, we're in a small market um, kind of town where we're working for a small to medium uh, nonprofit and we, we need talent. We've kind of put out our fundraising positions in the past and realized that, you know, we're just not getting that pull, right? So um, how do we kind of start diversifying that? How do we start identifying people and inviting them to see themselves as fundraisers? Uh, again, I, lacing in the Fundraise for Australia kind of um, approach, we're looking for skills. The good thing about fundraising is you can pretty much just be doing one job today and then start fundraising the next day. Obviously, it is a bit more nuanced to that, and I'm uh, very much over generalizing it. But, um, you know, if we can kind of start, um, you know, seeing the skills, the, the not only the hard skills that are transferable, but the soft skills. And how do we kind of we can't teach them to an extent where we can see that kind of huge measurable difference. But I think tinkering around the edge so and identifying talent for what it is and seeing the ceiling uh, we can really um, find diamonds in the rough, like um, people that are in SaaS sales, for example. They sell products. If we can get them to see uh, that that product being, again, the case for support, you know, uh, solving homelessness, uh, looking at world-class research, then they're going to be able to articulate that message because really the only um, thing that I see uh, that really is an archetype of fundraisers is they're personable, they're able to hold a conversation. I, I see them mainly as knowledge brokers. They can articulate a vision and they can uh, connect people uh, to, again, that expertise to really get them over the line for making big gifts. So um, just, I guess, how do we call in that new talent? We're talking about the great resignation. I, I, there's many different kind of uh, facets to that and people are coining different uh, lines as, uh, I guess, a subheading. 
But the reality is uh, the market is a lot more fluid since COVID. Um, fundraisers are very much in demand. So they're really in control of their own destinies. Um, a lot of people, is, um, you know, if fundraisers on the call now, they're um, no doubt getting emails from recruiters quite often. Um, so how do we get the people that are being laid off by uh, tech companies, you know, the project managers, et cetera, very values driven uh, from the organizations they've been working. They really want to make a large impact. How do we get them to see um, the social sector, social enterprise, nonprofits as um, really a destination for their talents from where they can grow and they can cheat everything they want and also get the uh, kind of pay packet that, you know, their work or their, um, you know, they know their value of. Um, AI and the jobs of tomorrow. I wrote uh, very much in my book that, you know, AI is going to automate a lot of uh, traditional industries and it's going to mean a lot of people moving to the service sector. Um, you know, that's health, that is kind of non-profits. So we talk about that generational uh, transfer of wealth. We need to look at it as that generational transfer of talent as well. And that's something that uh, I think we're missing the boat on. We're not, we, with the, uh, the transitional wealth, I think we um, see that as a given that people are going to give more, but no, it's an opportunity. And I think we should look at kind of talent there as well. So we're going to start seeing jobs in terms of maybe community organizers, uh, you know, uh, journalists uh, in community foundations, uh, data analysts when it comes to uh, investments. Uh, I think you're going to really see new people coming in where there is uh, term limits as well. I think we're seeing some great research come out of uh, some of the foundations and regional associations of grant makers where um, they're exploring program officers just coming onto four-year contracts that are not renewable because again um, having someone on the ground that has their finger on the pulse is uh, really important to um, you know making sure uh, one you're representing the communities you serve um, and two um, you know that fresh ideas are coming in new energy etc so that's where I see the jobs are tomorrow and this is where non-profit Moneyball really comes in. Again, we're looking for the, the traits, right? We're looking for the skills uh, of people that could be great fundraisers. Uh, Fundraise for Australia is partnering with GoFundMe, and we're in the process of working out a mechanism uh, to invite people that raise over $5,000 on their platform to then receive an invitation to see fundraising as a, a potential career. These are people that are, you know, motivated. They obviously have been successful in fundraising on the platform due to their authenticity, being able to personalize a message. You know, we don't need all the slick documents. We've gone are the days of the, the big media coming in to support nonprofit by building, you know, a series of videos for $50,000 and then the uh, click return is like four, 47, right? Um, we're seeing a, a lot more nimble, uh, you know, us being more nimble in the field. So, when it comes to uh, talent ID, again, it's working as a team, sitting down and identifying what the best skills are. Um, I have got really interested in this space just due to uh, my wife being a technical recruiter. So she showed me all the back end of like a, a Salesforce uh, seat or uh, table, whatever it's called, and then kind of doing Boolean searches. And uh, I guess we can search even further now because uh, COVID and uh, the changing workforce People are looking to work in hybrid roles now. And I mean, nonprofits, unless they are kind of place based and they are serving um, people on the ground, if it's uh, more of a, a national um, policy support, we can be identifying the best and brightest uh, nationwide, even internationally. So, again, I think that we have more opportunity here and it's about understanding the playing field. So um, in terms of recruitment, I think it, uh, a lot of it is the simplicity of, you know, it's what we do in fundraising, it's asking. Uh, when I came to the ANU, I had to recruit from the US. So I just moved back from Austin um, in May of last year. And there wasn't really the talent in the capital here. Um, so the capital isn't like DC, it's like a kind of um, a bush capital, uh, like in, in the outback. It's only got a, um, a population of around 450,000. So there isn't that much kind of um, talent in uh, terms of experience off the shelf, you know, a fundraiser who's been in the market um, it's in the space of three to five years. So again, it's going in there, identifying the skills and then asking them through LinkedIn for a conversation. Um, I just posted a job for a new administrative coordinator. And really, again, if they don't see themselves ticking all the boxes for what the um, job criteria is, invite them to have a conversation or better yet to still apply. Um, because when it gets onto, again, the HR empowerment stuff, 
uh, we really need to be looking for the skills, getting them in and having that uh, part where they are sending in their resumes as the credentialing part. Um, if they move to an interview, you don't need to double down too much on uh, their experience. Like, why did you spend two years here? Why did you have a gap of six months here? Um, and have a lot of those kind of really old traditional questions. If they're having an interview, they really have, um, you know, shown that they have something and it's really about talking about culture and fit and then how do you see themselves working in in that um i became fascinated with the predictive index uh, so that's kind of like a um you know a disc uh, the kind of um you know uh, traits uh, identifier thing so really um what it was is uh, it identifies again those kind of traits tendencies cognitive abilities and it provides a, a pattern analysis so basically, you kind of give uh, everyone on your team um, a test, and they will uh, it will show the skills um, on that pattern, and then you kind of, it gives you an ideal uh, scaling of um, that the person that's missing from your team essentially. So once you kind of go through the interview, and then you, you've really got a like for like candidate um, on uh, the like the final two, final three, you put them uh, through this uh, test, and it will then kind of uh, place them on the map. So you can see again if their traits and tendencies are going to be a long-term fit um, and then, you know, it informs decisions. You can't uh, have behavioural assessments really adjudicating whether a person is or is not a good fit for a role. Again, it's to, to guide, right? So, um, I mean, if you have like, like candidates at the end, you um, should lean into um, a candidate that um, brings a diverse perspective or experience. Um, you should be, again, looking at other needs, right? So, HR empowerment is about letting them move beyond that kind of binary approach to, um, you know, identifying stuff through resumes. It's not kind of putting it through and looking for the keywords or, you know, do they have the right experience or do they have a university degree? Again, having them look for the diamonds in the rough. And, you know, when you have a uh, interview pool of five, are those two, two of those, again, people with higher potential that potentially don't have the experience. I think that that's something the nonprofit sector actually has the opportunity right now to take risks on because uh, there's such a, a really high kind of, yeah, again, ceiling or um, upsell there. So uh, retaining. So again, we lose a lot of talent. There's that 16 months uh, kind of uh, figure, right, where people are transitioning not only out of their roles, but out of the sector. So we're losing a lot of kind of fundraising uh, assets, as it were. So the continued prof uh, professionalization of the sector um, in Australia right now, uh, we're, very, we're buoyed by the uh, new federal government that's come in and made a commitment to double philanthropy by 2030. So again, um, I have had a chat with the minister, I've had a chat with many of the kind of heads of the national associations. And fundraisers weren't even in that conversation. So they were going to build all the, uh, the uh, I guess, the structures that can, um, you know, drive new incentives for giving, et cetera. They were going to put a whole campaign, but they didn't really identify the, the key part, which was, again, who's going to make those asks? Who's actually going to bring that money in? Um, and so they're starting to change now and look at, you know, how do we improve uh, the, the skills of the current fundraisers? But again, that needs to be expanded to, again, identify new, uh, talent and bring them in you know there is no undergraduate degree for fundraising right so we have I'm a CFRE I'm a CFRE international ambassador so I'm constantly looking uh, to recruit uh, folks to again take that next step in their career and really uh, become students of fundraising uh, but there's only 110 115 CFREs in Australia um, there's like eight and a half thousand worldwide and that's really kind of the the main uh, credential right so how do we kind of start building the pipelines by having guidance counselors at high school encourage people who show the skills of being you know connectors storytellers etc uh look at nonprofits in the social sector and how do we have that pipeline right so you know it could be community college uh it could be in australia the equivalent which is called tafe um you know having one year fundraising courses to up uh you know upskill them and make sure they can hit the ground running because um, a lot of the smaller nonprofits, it's it's hard for them to put up a hundred thousand uh, dollars for a new salary um, and to build from scratch a whole fundraising shop. So that's again, you know, building a CRM. Um, um, it's about kind of building pipeline, etc. Some organisations don't have that eighteen month to two year runway to to build that up. So again, how do we um, skill people up? So like the fundraising academy at National University is a great example. 
um, you know, ones where training is affordable as well. So educating industry, again, it's kind of uh, what is the nonprofit sector? Like, where is it going? What can it be? 501c3 is a tax designation. It's not a business model. Um, I remember one of my early fundraising uh, kind of goals was to raise $12 million for a new um, education centre. And we had a very shallow donor base of 100 people. But again, it was looking outside of uh, just grants and, um, you know, just philanthropy in general and seeing that, you know, having uh, the uh, the project move to a promise zone could open new market tax credits, it could open uh, a range of match funding and then bring in impact investing as well. So educating the whole of industry of what philanthropy is, how people can give, how people can support, um, a, again, uh, fundraising and seeing fundraising and philanthropy not as a, uh, a dirty word, right? Um, re having fundraisers reclaim what philanthropy is, having, you know, the next generation, the Gen Zs come through and just say, okay, philanthropy means this to me. It might be giving $20 to your friend for Movember. It might be supporting uh, your aunt who's running in a 5K. Those are acts of philanthropy. So how do we kind of tap into that goodwill and empathy for the community that we've seen a lot of disasters recently. So how do we activate that more long term? You know, people are inherently good, I believe. And um, you know, giving can be an extension of that. Again, um, looking at the individuals, the fundraisers, that mastery uh, kind of angle that we probably all grow up with, where it's like, you know, you need to do a thousand um, hours of professional uh, training to become a master of your field. Um, you know, fundraising is very unique there, right? I now believe that um, most companies are looking for generalists. If you look at a lot of the resumes of younger fundraisers coming through, again, they have been um, at an organization two years, then another organization two years. They're leveling up each time. And I think gone are the times where we look at a fundraiser and go, okay, are they going to stay for five years or are they going to come in for two years? I'd much rather hire for someone coming in two years that will help improve my systems, improve the pipeline, and then come in. Because at the end of the day, fundraisers' relationships uh, aren't with the donor. It's the the relationship is with the uh, institution. So again, uh, fundraisers should be coming in and looking at the CRM and picking up from where the le last fundraiser uh, left off. And that's how you kind of secure gives it a lot faster. Um, again, advocating for excellence. Uh, you know, if we, you have a goal, let's hit that goal as fast as we can. Let's kind of build sustainability. Let's again look outside the box. Let's celebrate the wins. I think fundraising is one of those uh, professions, right, where we play a pivotal role sometimes. Um, you know, sometimes it's not kind of the, the key part. And this goes to, um, the, again, the nonprofit money board thesis. I see fundraisers as the quarterback. You know, they uh, have a set game plan to execute, uh, which is uh, really drawn up by the coaches and the kind of uh, team executive. Uh, you know, that is like the owners of the team. And the uh, quarterback executes the plays. They can score. They can score touchdowns. Uh, but sometimes it's like, you know, do you pass it off to your running back, which could be, uh, someone on your volunteer board? Do you uh, throw it to your wide receiver, which could be your CEO? Again, it's kind of that, that team ethic. So with fundraisers, the, the point I was going to make there is, um, you know, they play a role, but they're hardly celebrated uh, when it comes to a donor. And I, I understand, again, there are levels to this, but if you look at it, a very kind of binary nature, um, you know, we do large stories about the donor and their generosity. We talk a lot about the organisation. And, uh, you know, there's a quiet pat on the back in the office for, you know, raising a $10 million gift. Um, why is it a faux pas to celebrate that on social media um, in your role in playing that? It will uh, have a lot of people really understand fundraising more. Again, see fundraisers as uh, critical in the whole kind of scheme of things. And uh, hopefully, um, you know, see them treated as they uh, should be in the organization then there for you know two to five years you know that ideal window that we're talking about we need to get them there by again um, giving them uh, opportunities to grow uh, working with them to see where they can grow uh, not uh, I've seen a tendency for small uh, nonprofits to pay the top dollar amount and then there is no growth there is no kind of scaling up the ladder you know, they're a director of development when before they were just a, um, a development associate. You know, how do we, again, build levels and build uh, a career? Uh, these are all things we need to look at. And I talk about creating moments of growth. Um, we actually have one um, afternoon a quarter where I actually let our fundraisers go out 
and just do whatever they want that's complementary to their role. If they want to learn more about First Nations people, go to a museum and go to one of the exhibits there to learn. Uh, better get, take uh, the afternoon, have a coffee with uh, one of the um, community elders. Again, um, how do we ideate? How do we let people be creative? And that's the whole point of the fundraiser for these uh, small medium uh, shops, right? It's to also free up other positions to think creatively. And when we actually, automation is going to help with that. Obviously, it's going to free up a lot of the rudimentary administrative tasks. But if we do that, we shouldn't be backfilling it with more admin. You know, we should be freeing up people to go out, explore more, uh, speak with more people. You know, the ideal fundraiser is out there and not behind their desk all the time. Uh, optimize. Again, this is kind of the tech part. This is, again, uh, the fun part of my book, as it were. Uh, you know, the tools, I talked to about predictive index, but again, we're talking a lot about chat GPT and natural language processing. Again, that's that's helpful. It's going to make you uh, be able to craft 1,000, uh, you know, uh, non-copied emails to um, folks saying thank you for annual giving. There's a, a lot more power to that, and obviously I'm overgeneralizing there, but um, AI is going to be super helpful, again, in uh, process workflow. It's going to be able to help us close gifts quicker. It's going to be able to kind of uh, give more research uh, to us. Um, I see AI and machine learning in the nonprofit space uh, much more at the, what is it going to be in 10 years? Like, is it going to be able to um, identify new ways of supporting people with mental, mental health? Is it going to support new ways of tackling uh, homelessness and, and poverty, uh, you know, things that we just can't see. We as organizations sit in troves and troves of data, right? But we can't see uh, a lot of those patterns. So uh, again, getting that computational help, I think is going to make us more effective in the work we do as well. Um, and yeah, it's kind of a lot of tech will, again, expand our networks. But the most important part here is it gives us uh, hope right? Um, I think that we have um, people that have been in the uh, profession for such a long time that I probably are resonating again with the professionalization, the kind of the growth, um, you know, tech coming in to support our work and also be able to um, critique it um, and, um, you know, score it. Again, uh, the hardest thing is to um, count what doesn't normally get count. Again, the time taken to cultivate a um, a donor, um, the kind of the marketing stuff that we do, the storytelling, uh, you know, informing uh, the comms team, et cetera. How do we kind of count all that and really paint a picture of our profession? So I'll just kind of wrap up again quickly with, um, you know, uh, what can we be doing? What should we be thinking about? Um, I really would encourage folks to, again, look what that future might look like in their field, what it might look like in their career and how do you uh, kind of combine the two? Um, you know, talking about it in, um, you know, your kind of stand-up meeting. So in, you know, pitching new uh, tech options. There's uh, a lot of uh, freemium kind of uh, tools out there you can uh, do a trial with. Um, I did text messaging for the first time at the University of Texas. Like I had to pitch why we should do it. And I think uh, a lot of it is to do with, again, the, the trust. You're more likely to answer a text than you um, are um, to answer a call with no number and so trialing that out and um, you know we went through a good six month process about you know the pros and cons and what we're actually looking at doing and is a good outcome to get a, uh, a meeting with a major uh, gift um, prospect is it to disqualify someone and during that session which is just it was just serendipitous right and I think it's just good luck for this story is uh, I raised uh, $100,000 for a new scholarship out of a, a four back and forth conversations uh, through that SMS platform. So again, tech is there to, to help. So uh, again, don't be afraid of using a lot of the stats that are coming out of the industry now to um, like pitch up to your leadership why you should do a trial with it. Um, what trends in the sector are you most excited about? Feel free to drop that in chat. I think that that can inform uh, Jay and I's conversation moving forward. And this is the most important one to me. It's kind of a reflective piece. Um, if AI, if tech, if kind of new staff could help you recoup one hour of day, um, uh, your work day, what would you use it on? Would you use it on more outreach? Would you take a, another meeting? Um, really interested to hear what people's thoughts are there. Um, we can do a lot. Uh, you know, the profession can be more, do more, um, achieve more. And, um, you know, I think it really comes down to 
uh, you know, taking a chance on uh, on talent and uh, helping it grow and thrive within your organisation. So I'll stop there. Um, thanks for, for the time and, and hopefully uh, you know, it's sparked some interest. You, you've got a lot of, of, of things for us to talk about. Thank you so much, Ryan. Um, and I wrote a whole page of notes. So I want to make sure that uh, before we go too much further, I encourage people to go ahead and maybe answer those questions. I even put one of them in here about AI earlier, just asking, um, how are you using, are you using AI and machine learning in your fundraising work, which is kind of a really basic question. But the reason why I put it there is that uh, I think it was uh, Nathan Chappelle who in a recent um, uh, conference asked people in the conference, in the middle of all these discussions about chat GPT, to raise their hands if they were using it in any way. And there were about 100 people in the room and two people raised their hands. Now, I know one conference is not a, you know, a national survey, but it was kind of interesting because it is a big part of, of everything that we're talking about, but very few people are practicing. I'm wondering, Ryan, in your experience, how much of this is like when you were introducing SMS or when some of us who are, you know, have been around the block a few times, we're trying to get people to use email fundraising, which I know sounds hilarious now, but the, but it wasn't long ago that email fundraising, social media fundraising, crowdfunding, all these things, which now are commonplace, people wouldn't touch them. That that, that they were it was not going to work. So, yeah. what was it like for you to introduce some of these concepts? How did you make people do it? Um. The funny thing is, like the SMS uh, thing was at the University of Texas, which we know has a huge fundraising machine. It's going for a $6 billion campaign, uh, you know, the second largest endowment in the country behind Harvard. This was only two and a half years ago. So right. this is text messaging. It's kind of, uh, you know, it was how do you, uh, what are the steps to disqualify a, um, a prospect as a major gift prospect? And, you know, you have to do five touches. It's kind of, you know, email is obviously one, telephone, meeting. And I'm like, we sit on all these uh, phone numbers. Why one? Uh, why aren't we actually checking if they are new and, and constant? And uh, two, why are we not actually utilizing it? And there was a, a conversation about again, um, uh, really kind of uh, security issues, etc. But I spent a good. This was during COVID. I spent a good six months back and forth. Uh, tinkering with a proposal. It was really just a memo to leadership saying, this is why we should do it. Again, getting all the stats from the text, um, uh, I guess, industry, seeing that text messaging now has gone from, you know, six cents. Uh, um, well, uh, when Obama was uh, running through uh, his re-election campaign, text mm -hmm. was something um, up at like 12 cents. Uh, then uh, when it got to um, the uh, Trump uh, election, that was uh, down to six cents. And someone asked me when I was having a meeting when we were talking about kind of campaign tech, if you can get um, it down to, um, you know, two or three cents, you know, you're, um, you're going to make a lot of money. And uh, now it's at 0 0.026 uh, cents um, to send uh, an SMS. So again, it's kind of using data to inform decision making. And you don't have to get everything. Progress is what uh, fundraisers should be looking at. So just getting a trial period and executing in a way you know it's going to be uh, successful will get uh, that platform onto your suite of tools uh, moving forward. So again, we're starting to get a bit more sophisticated. There are some great uh, organizations out there now that are really uh, looking at the stats and they're giving us the stories and the messages we need to take back to demystify the tech um, and you know move forward. So um, yeah, I'm I'm buoyed, I'm bullish about kind of uh, tech moving forward, but you're right. People are scared to use it. It's like it, if it's not broken, um, if it's not broken, why fix it? Kind of thing. Um, but you know, it's about efficiencies and driving more dollars and impact. Um, you know, for the communities and the people that yeah, might. yeah. I, I you know, it strikes me that because much of what you're talking about with us today has to do with making you know increasing efficiencies, but also that that in a way can mean it doesn't have to mean, but it can mean that we are we get better individually at what we do not just institutionally so it, the fear factor the chat gpt is going to steal my job and i i remember hearing that about prospect research years ago there's going to be a profile button and then it's going to be the end of prospect research all these things that happen um are, are i wonder where that fear comes from and it, it sounds like if you had a six-month window at ut 
to get them to adopt SMS. Um, much of that was just a matter of helping people acclimate to a concept to realize that it was not a threat, but in fact, it would enhance their own position as well as the institution's position. Is that fair? Yes, that is very fair. And that's how we should be approaching things like chat GPT as well. Like we shouldn't just use it on the sly and then use it as like a, a Trojan horse, right? Sending a couple of emails internally and seeing if anyone notices. Right. Um, you know, it's quite duplicitous. Like we, sh the um, the organisation should lean into it because again, it can save hours and time is a precious commodity for small and to medium fundraising shops. Right, right. Well, in fact, you talked about that proposal and going back and forth for six months, and I know much of that was negotiation and taking time, but probably also you had to spend some time writing a proposal. Now, Chat GPT can accelerate that too a little bit. Um, <laughs> but we we had great comments also in here, just people saying. For example, Anne saying, so thank you for being here, Anne. Um, I wouldn't initiate many projects without chat GPT at this point, uh, and it saves time, but potentially more importantly, it also improves quality. Um, and uh, 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 Meryl is saying, yes, just beginning the last few months. Lasara, excuse me if I'm mispronouncing your name. Uh, I've used it to draft some things. I actually love working with chat GPT. Um, Lisa saying, we're starting to look at it and integrate it into our fund development messaging, et cetera. So I, I know that some people, uh, like another comment that just came in said, I haven't tried it. Uh, it's definitely not mandatory, but I guess like anything, we have to figure out where things fit for us and where they help us get better. And also the products, it's, this is not, um, it's a moving target. I mean, the chat GPT we looked at a couple months ago is not the one that you get today for 20 bucks a month. That it's, it's a true. fundamentally different product, but that's also true of everything you said, like SMS or, there was something that really hit me. I know it's not in your last series of questions, but I have to ask before I forget because it's fascinating. I'm also curious with the audience if um, if many of you have used any form of crowdfunding. That might sound like an obvious question, but some do and some don't. So whether that's um, Giving Tuesday or a one day campaign that you do that's largely digital or anything like that. Um, and uh, yes, people are saying I pay for ChatGPT. Yes. Um, so Dorica uh, says yes. You know, Roxanne, yes. The reason I'm asking this question, uh, and Lasara, thank you. Yes. Um, the reason I'm asking is because you said something here about recruitment, which really hit me. I had not thought about this at all before. And that's that when it comes to talent ID, there are a whole bunch of people out there, including probably everybody in this call who uses Facebook, who at some point has tried to raise a few dollars for somebody, for something. Uh, whether it's making a contribution of $10 to help some relative or a friend of or a friend of a friend, or whether it's setting up a campaign to kind of help your school out. The um, crowdfunding is is part and parcel of our daily life now. That's why while those campaigns tend to be small, so much money is raised through Facebook. And uh, but the idea of going and finding successful GoFundMe organizers and trying to recruit them to be professional fundraisers. I haven't heard people talking about that. And but now that you say it, it seems so obvious. So how have you yeah. actually um, uh, developed a process for doing that? Yeah, well, the first thing is finding uh, the right partners, right? So, um, you know, they uh, go fund me. Uh, I when I was in San Diego, um, it's a San Diego company. So obviously, I knew a lot about them and uh, one of the co-funders when they first uh, got acquired or sold it, I guess, Andy Ballister, uh, he really kind of leaned into impact investing mm -hmm. and sold, trying to solve homelessness. And uh, again, just uh, enamored by a lot of the organizations that uh, they have ended up swallowing up, like kind of classy is another example, right? Um, and the thing that they're doing now is obviously identifying all the data that they sit on and kind of to, uh, informing their uh, customers and clients about, hey, um, a lot of people seem to be giving to, to this one uh, over which is your core uh, campaign message. Have you thought about pivoting, et cetera? But again, you know, we sit on the data and it's just looking at it from a different perspective. Like a lot of my work, I think that's probably kind of how my dyslexia is like my uh, kind of secret weapon, as it were. <laughs> I, I don't just think sure. outside the box. I think from yeah. a totally different box. And um, all of the um, things I've trialed, like I, I've built crowdfunding platforms where, um, you know, we're sourcing uh, policy change where you can kind of upvote it and you can only put it to um, public if you um, connect with someone from across the aisle. Again, just experimenting with different um, you know, problems with society and um, again, you know, using the data behind the scenes to 
tell the story. So again, every user has a story and mm -hmm. every user, you know, maybe doesn't even know what the, the power they have. And, um, you know, again, the impact they're having more broadly because GoFundMe, for example, uh, tells uh, stories, it inspires people. They had a really good plugin back in the day with the San Diego Union Tribune where um, on all the online stories, if you felt kind of the need to support them, uh, you, there was a, a, a tab at the bottom where you can click on it and start fundraising for the people that were a victim of shooting or a hit and run example. Right. So again, there's so many ways that we can um, you know, get people to see philanthropy again as um, you know, a, new, a new national value. Um, you know, what, what is America? Could it be the most generous country in the world? Um, you know, Australia is definitely looking at that. You know, we've been uh, classified as the lucky country back in the day because of, you know, um, our right. ability to, uh, you know, navigate the global downturn. But that, a lot of that was because we've got a lot of uh, natural resources. But now, could we be the most generous country? And could we be a blueprint for philanthropy? Could we be a, a charitable hub uh, for, um, you know, Southeast Asia and uh, Singapore and Malaysia and all of those emerging economies? So, um, yeah, we just got to look at, you know, at what is very uh, traditional now and ways that we can utilize a lot of the new trends in a way that benefits uh, the impact we're trying to have. Right. Well, I'm also happy to hear you talk about Australia's natural resources, since it seems like all the videos uh, that I see, short form videos, are about giant spiders and snakes. So uh, thank you for dispelling the terrible prejudice we have about how dangerous it is to live in Australia. Oh, it's real. My wife uh, is American and she, she's struggling. I'm always getting hearing streams. So yeah, it's very real. <laughs> okay. Well, just if you if you come to visit soon, just don't bring any of those big fun creatures with you. Um, and, and I knew you had a couple of other questions here that we really should um, pull the audience about. And one of them was uh, about um, what the future might look like in 10 years, which I know is the ultimate, <laughs> ultimate softball question. Kind of funny to say that in the context of Moneyball. Um, but it is important and because doesn't future casting require us to some degree to be able to say the reason why we want to do something tomorrow is to get to the place we want to be in 10 years? Yeah, oh, you're, you're spot on. Like uh, the future is what we want it to be, right? I think that um, we can't get there. Again, um, it goes to kind of the demystifying tech and being worried. I honestly think that doing strategic plans stifle creativity in the nonprofit space it um it boxes us into like three to four to five years um and it doesn't make us look at 10 years like again we look at okay well this board member is going to cycle off next year they come in with new ideas and the organization totally pivots in some cases so um whether sometimes that's good like if a, a company wants to i mean an organization wants to look more at um, equity issues um mm -hmm. or kind of race that's fantastic but I am uh, a proponent of uh, strategic uh, kind of cycling. So again, where do we want to go in 10 years? And when we get to a milestone, that, that makes us move on to the next phase. And what that can do is, it, again, um, you know, make us more nimble, agile, creative. Um, it can make us look at, um, okay, so we're in this phase now. So this phase we noted would be one where we would... Um, you know, we're sustainable, we just diversified our revenue streams. This is where we get to the next level. So uh, tech could be a component of that. So um, during this phase, we're going to recruit a couple of people that have IT knowledge or, um, you know, uh, work for a nonprofit tech company. Again, you know, how do we get to 10 years? You know, nonprofits are established to put themselves out of business, but we don't do that. We do a softly, softly approach to make sure that we continue to be in business day after day because of people's jobs. Like I, I want to live in a world where we solve homelessness. I want to live in a world where we cut kind of uh, poverty in half. Um, and that's what I work towards. And that's why I have these conversations about getting new talent in, new ideas. Um, because, you know, nonprofit system isn't broken. It's just super stagnant. And, you know, again, all the work that's been done over a hundred of years, that tells a story and it should inform better decision-making. It should inform different approaches because philanthropy to me right now is just societal triage rather than seeing the solutions of tomorrow. I, um, this might be kind of a, you know, a poking the bear question, not not with you being the bear, but just the bear out there somewhere, which is how much of this is, is a generational issue? Because I know that people of a certain age, like myself, that sometimes they've been resistant to certain things. And I don't just mean in terms of tech, 
but and I don't mean in terms of necessarily new ideas, but maybe where the ideas emanate from. And I, I wonder if if there's a way to get people to be not just receptive to and um, and tolerant of ideas that are new to them, especially from a rising generation, um, but actually seeking them out and trying to bring them in, because that's where not only do we come up with good ideas, but we come up with more revenue. I mean, if we don't have more revenue, we can't solve homelessness for one thing. So how do we get... How did you get the people at UT and all the places you've worked with in these different places and the people you've talked to in the context of the book, especially if they've been around for two, three, four decades, to start thinking, I better listen to someone who's only been around for 15 minutes because they might be looking at this with fresh eyes? Um, to be honest, no one used to listen and I had to get smarter. So again, bringing in the right people, going out um, and helping them recruit new ideas to kind of the board helping, uh, again, bringing in staff that shared the same ideas and values and then showing the results. Like I, um, you know, you kind of had that big iceberg of fundraising, right? You've seen kind of the images where it has underneath, you know, research, uh, kind of uh, prospect ID, board um, kind of referrals. But at the end of the day, leadership only see the dollar on the top. So I found that the best way to um, give myself enough goodwill to go and pitch something is to do what I'm hired to do and that's raise money and then uh, you know make sure I raise my goals as quick as possible so then you know I've got time to um, you know share ways that we can be even better like I think when we come to fundraising goals right you go okay this is the end of the year we hit x let's chuck another 10 percent on it that's not built in any kind of uh, reality so Again, you know, how do we kind of inform uh, better decision making? How do we kind of get, um, give us everything we need to do to, you know, again, level up and really uh, excel in the, the work we do and the, the work we're passionate about? You know, I I was just a very, very small fish in a very big pond. And then I wrote a book and then things changed, right? And then I get opportunities to speak here. I'm still learning. And I think that if we can adopt that kind of learning culture uh, in our space, uh, be open to new ideas and, um, you know, kind of critique them at um, their, their real worth. Um, you know, I, I'm all for nonprofits um, and nonprofit tech companies giving new solutions. If they don't work, it doesn't matter. Like if the best thing they can do, and I'm, I saw it at Pond, um, the, uh, the nonprofit marketplace that was, do, it was like a tech marketplace and uh, they were paying people to do demos and, uh, you know, explore new tech options based on their ideas. They they folded, but the CEO actually went out and shared uh, the reasons for why it folded. It's like Fundraise for Australia. I said, let's do a pilot of 25 people. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't work, we'll report out what we learned and what the data was. So some people, right. uh, some person can look at it, pick it up and potentially get us one step closer to a solution in this space. And, um, you know, again, we sit on data and we're lazy, like we've got real opportunity uh, to maybe even donate data to a foundation that, you know, will, can be charged with, you know, again, doing research reports and informing our decisions so we can get bigger grants, right, um, that can uh, show us where we're going and if we're having a real impact, not a perceived impact where we cherry pick the stats. It's, uh, you know, that's one of my real ills. Um, uh, Ick, sorry, around philanthropy and uh, community foundations. You know, they give money to um, uh, kind of the nonprofit to do the work. It's very much in a confetti approach. And then they come in at the end of the year with a um, cherry pick the data um, and have the photo and do the media release and get all the credit for it. Like that's just not the way philanthropy should be. It should be, again, a lot more uh, inclusive and, uh, you know, a, a true partnership on behalf of the community. So. Yeah, it seems like um, a lot of people are uh, in a self-protective mode, and I don't know yeah. where that fear comes from, uh, because they're, they're, I mean, most are obviously very sincere and hardworking, but yeah. if they've got this protective layer, then it becomes difficult to um, to move beyond it. It becomes your own prison. I, I realized, though, speaking of my own prison, that I wasn't looking at the Q&A. So first of all, Morgan, I apologize. I'm re need, reading your question now. And that's that with the erosion of the middle class in the U.S., more dollars are being given by fewer donors and larger amounts. This is something we've talked a lot about in this series. It's really a, an interesting riddle and it may be different in Australia. I wanna acknowledge that first before I ask you the rest of this, but certainly true here. How will technology and AI influence the nonprofit sector, particularly in relationship to growing major gifts? 
how does, uh, uh, for example, they, they ask about donor search, but how does, how do any of these companies, I guess, or how do you uh, see responding to this continuing trend? Yeah, um, well, in terms of Australia, we're we're very high in that kind of generosity rankings, but as a percentage of GDP, we are very much behind a lot of the kind of westernized nations uh, across the globe. So yes, we do have issues, and that's why we're trying to double giving by 2030. Um, in terms of, uh, again, AI uh, moving us forward in major gifts, it's uh, I think it's kind of, it helps with process. I think that we um, spend way too long uh, in the cultivation phase because we're trying to build that rapport and trust, which can be established pretty quickly. I, I'm, um, I'm a very much a proponent of the plus delta model. And I think you can kind of get to major gifts asks um, in uh, free meetings. Um, so again, how do we have the data that shows that? Um, and it's not kind of just the gut, like um, I had a meeting with a prospect um, and we, we had dinner and um, it was a great conversation and showed all the markers and we asked them for $5 million the next day. Um, he then said, uh, come back to me, something's larger. I have a uh, kind of uh, a capital gains uh, issue. And, you know, that moved forward really swiftly. So um, a lot of AI and tech should be getting us, really giving us the ability to get out there more. Um, you know, AI in our CRM, again, identifying keywords through natu natural language processing, right? So if we've got a new, uh, we want to stand up a new um, center for machine learning, anyone that is in our database that has mentioned machine learning that has been, um, you know, added in by a, um, you know, a fundraiser into the notes, we should be able to pull that and pull a list. So we've got then a pipeline of, say, 30 individuals that we should go through and see if they're interested in supporting it. Again, um, you know, a lot of people that are doing um, uh, annual giving, like maybe even if it's just kind of $100 a year that we hadn't seen because it hasn't kind of uh, hit those uh, major gift milestones. But again, the, the model has seen that there's intersection there between volunteering, uh, the annual giving, age, uh, the, in the notes, they, they haven't got children, you know, um, pinging a, a frontline fundraiser saying you should be talking to this person about um, a, a estate gift. And then, um, you know, secondly, uh, we, we, our data is showing that, you know, this would be a good candidate for a blended gift as well, an X amount. Again, it, it informs us to go after them. It's not a sure, uh, sure deal. It's not like a home run in the money, uh, money ball sense, right? Um, but again, there is a lot of data out there that can inform better decisions uh, and can, uh, you know, find the diamonds in the rough. You know, we all have that story of the, the um, old lady that left, you know, $5 million in our estate. No one knew about her. She hadn't actually been, um, you know, with the organization. We can find her 20 years earlier and have her become a partner of the organization, you know, potentially get more involved. Uh, it, you know, more money will flow in. There'll be a bigger impact. And, you know, she that person who gave will be able to see the impact as it happens. So, Again, you know, what is philanthropy to us right now? What can it be? Uh, um, you know, AI, I think, can help us tell that story. It also it seems to help with the velocity issue. And there, there are, th there's this expression that I'm sure that you've, you've heard plenty. Maybe you do or do not agree with it, that, um, that philanthropy moves at the speed of trust. But, mm -hmm. but that seems to imply that trust takes forever to build. And I wonder if maybe the opposite is true sometimes. If we are building, you said something really, uh, I thought was profound in terms of our recruitment and retaining of employees. There's this discussion about how um, a, a lot of development officers will come in, especially in higher ed settings, and they're there for 18 months and then they move on. And there's almost this dismissive attitude about it, like either they're just they're just in it for themselves or something like that. But you talked about this in a very different way, about how maybe two years when they're trying to build relationships with the institution not with the donors they're they're the uh, ambassadors for the work and to facilitate giving to the institution they're not there to build these infinite relationships um that it's it's very different so two years can be highly effective maybe more effective in many respects than somebody who's around for five or ten years and that's a very positive way of viewing what people can do with a limited amount of time to help a donor and an institution make something profound happen um, yeah. Are you finding people responsive to that argument? Uh, yes, um, I, I think they come in as a circuit breaker. But again, you've got to make the case. You've got to make the case uh, to your uh, hiring committee as well. So again, getting the right people on there, empowering HR to go, OK, getting someone in two years, 
it might, you know, we see all the stats about how expensive it is to lose someone after two years. But again, we're cherry picking the data there to show why people should stay and, um, you know, hitting that narrative of, you know, we can only be successful if someone's in there five years because they've taken the time to cultivate, um, you know, build the trust, you know, get that big gift. But again, we are um, representatives of the organisation. We don't take that relationship to the next uh, kind of organisation. It pains me. It really pains me when I hear a fundraiser going, oh, that's, a, that's an interesting question because uh, I was interviewed um, and they basically said, um, who do you know? And they go for people that are more networked rather than the kind of skills. And, um, you know, it's the power dynamics of not the nonprofit world that has, you know, really... Um, you know, being a, a cancer on our field be, and, you know, made sure the bigger organisations keep on getting bigger. Um, you know, they're the ones that scoop up all of the big grants uh, because, you know, the CEOs, uh, you know, going to the same country club dinners as, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the grant making chair of that big foundation. So mm -hmm. again, I, I think that hiring people for, again, the skills and what they can do within a two year time frame. Uh, that go on and do great stuff afterwards as well. Like they actually kind of, you know, they'll go into bigger and better jobs and they'll also tell a great story of the organization uh, that they kind of worked for. Right. Um, right. You know, we need to start understanding again what the next generation, when they become, uh, they come of age professionally, what they want. They only want to stay two years as well because they want to keep on learning. It's like that generalist mindset. So give them what they want, give them the opportunity to learn, give them the opportunity to get out the, uh, on the ground and, you know, uh, again, have conversations that we probably haven't had in the past because we've been too scared to have them or we haven't thought of uh, kind of these new ways fundraisers to me are, are changing they are knowledge brokers they um you know are data translators they you know, again they have a case for support and they've got to be in the moment um they need enough to know uh, they need to know enough about the subject matter to hold a conversation and move it to the next level where they connect the expertise it's like when i was at um, the school of computer science at ut you know, did I start learning about quantum computing? Yes. Am I ever going to be able to do anything there? Am I ever going to be able to talk with an international um, you know, scientist? No, but I know enough to um, have them go, okay, this is interesting. And then I'll connect them with the expertise, right? So uh, again, let's, let's start hiring for what we need, uh, not hiring the person because they have five years experience at, um, you know, UNICEF or they have five years uh, experience at the Red Cross. That means nothing at the end of the day. You, you're you making assumptions on how those entities work. Um, and yeah, let, let's just do it right and let data uh, lead us there. And uh, nothing against UNICEF or the Red Cross. That was not the No, point. not at all. I, I work with <laughs> we love the UNICEF and the Red Cross. <laughs> yeah, but you know, unfortunately we have to use the big players uh, to show the Absolutely. short point. Absolutely. On um, and Ryan, maybe one more question as we kind of get get to, close to the end here. Um, and I want to thank you also for doing this all, all the way around, uh, both for everything you've shared, um, but also doing this so and possibly early in the morning. So thank you for all of that. But this great question came in from Laura, who had said, so getting to major asks in three meetings, which you talked about a minute ago, feels perhaps appropriate for institutional nonprofits that essentially service their own donors, like private schools, colleges, hospitals, museums, et cetera which is where at least 85% of all resources in the nonprofit sector sit in the US, mm -hmm. um, maybe more with, with endowments. But what about community-based organizations? And, um, and then I'm just gonna go down to the end. How can these tools, and I would argue also processes, because we're really talking about tools when we've talked about AI and SMS and all these things, but we're also talking about a way of thinking about things. How can these tools and processes help them, especially help these, uh, these community-based organizations, especially when they aren't starting with large built-in donor bases and staff? Now, and by the way, I don't want to answer the question for you, but you made a reference earlier to only having, I think, 100 donors or something when you had to raise 14 million. Yeah, twelve. Yeah, so uh, look, yeah, it's confidence. Say? It's confidence. I, I think that that's the story that we're we're told, right? We, again, we need to build the relationships in a way where you know it's a sure fire thing. Like, I mean, I have now come to the realization that you know the best thing we can do is get a, a number of proposals out there, and you're not going to get 100. percent Like fundraisers, I've seen a lot of statistics. I've actually seen a company that looks at sandbagging, right? In terms of 
you know, people don't enter, uh, they don't give a proposal until it's like 95%, 100% sure because they're worried about rejection. Like wow. fundraisers need to know that, you know, you can be told no and that's fine. Mm. So um, again, we, we are too much in our heads. Like we need to, again, be, um, you know, good ambassadors of the organizations we represent. It's like, I speak to some amazing people uh, around politics. That was uh, what I was originally in before I transitioned across. Um, you know, for all people out there getting um, uh, kind of former political staffers, uh, they make great fundraisers, uh, just as a side note there. But, um, you know, they, a lot of them talk about running for office in like 10 years um, or, you know, six years, or they're, they're looking at a certain cycle and they won't uh, ask their donors uh, now because they want to ask them down the track for a political donation. That's all rubbish. Like you, like you can cut every goal you have by half if you're committed to it and you believe in it. Um, and for fundraisers, if you have a, a killer case for support, you can go out there and you can uh, make that case. Like, I just don't know what we're doing in meeting one if we're not asking them, you know, are you or ascertaining if they are philanthropic? Like, what do you do in the community? Um, you know, are you giving to other folks? It's a question that is natural for that. So if we actually, if we're having the meeting, they, they're obviously interested in the organization and having the conversation, right? Um, if people were very upfront and they're not trying to be a Trojan horse by going, oh, hi, I represent X and someone uh, reached out and said, I should cat, uh, catch up with you for coffee. Are you interesting in having a meeting? That is, that is just no good. It's basically trying to get the meeting, tricking them into the meeting so then you can have a conversation. I, my outreach is always, I, uh, my job is to raise resources um, for my organization to do X, Y, and Z. Right. If they say yes, then fantastic. We can actually move forward uh, very intentionally with that first conversation. And they've given permission really to, um, you know, allow me to ask those questions because we're getting to know each other. And at the end of every conversation, I'll say, look, it looks like you have an interest here. Um, I'm just really seeking your permission to continue the conversation and put something in front of you that might be of interest. And that gets us to the free. I, I could ask for a major gift in one meeting if I feel it's right. And I think fundraisers need that confidence and only the organizations can give us that confidence. Only training can give us that confidence, confidence in the story, confidence in our abilities and an understanding who fundraisers are and what they do um, for nonprofit organizations. Again, we, we can be better. And I, I know that everyone here, I think, and if this is what I want is them to walk out and then, um, you know, tomorrow morning they hit the ground running going, you know what? There's this person that I should have asked. Um, that I didn't. Let's just do it. Um, just, you know, just take some risks. It's high reward. And I can give an example of uh, an organization in Austin. So um, they were uh, a homeless uh, provider and uh, someone that I knew just joined their board and said, do you know anyone? I'm like, look, all my, um, uh, you know, I, I don't know too many people because I moved during COVID. But I do understand, I did see a media release come through that John Paul DeJoria, um, who is the owner of Patron, uh, kind of um, also the hairdressing uh, products, he's, he just um, had a public announcement with Dell Medical School looking at homelessness health. Mm -hmm. um, why don't you reach out to him? And I literally just gave um, a load of names and they messaged me four months later saying, um, and they sh shared photos saying, John Paul DeJoria, who's a billionaire, has just walked with us in the streets of Austin and he's just committed to giving, you know, a um, substantive gift for us to do our outreach and our work. Again, they knew who they are, where they wanted to go, and they made that ask when they had that opportunity. Sometimes we only get one meeting, right? And um, I think if we profess to understand that we're just one meeting away from that major gift, uh, it can really change our approaches. Um, but yeah, just, just be confident. Let's not use excuses. Let's not uh, be defensive in our work. We're here, we're employed to raise money, raise resources, build connections, and we can do that. Thank you so much for all this, Ryan. And I'm sorry, I know we have another question or two in the chat, but we'll have to unfortunately save that for another day. Hopefully we can wake you up early um, someday and, uh, and be able to have another conversation. But until then, I just want to tell you how grateful I am for, for you to come in and, and share with us today. Um, and uh, I also want to thank everybody for being here uh, and joining us for this conversation. I hope you'll come back for future sessions. We have one on Thursday with Peter Heller, 
who's going to be talking about capital campaigns. It's the reason we keep doing those is because so many people hold them. Um, and I'm sure we will infuse that conversation with what we just learned from Ryan, because you cannot do a capital campaign if you are reluctant, ultimately, to invite people to give to that campaign. It just doesn't work. Um, but anyway, I'll, I'll leave the rest to Peter, uh, and he'll be talking about all that on Thursday at 3.30. We also have a great episode of the podcast that was released this week uh, with Raj Vinokota um, that you'll enjoy. And so I hope if you like uh, listening that you'll check out the podcast. It's a great place to learn about people's personal stories and their whole their whole lives uh, in and out of uh, fundraising and philanthropy. And um, you can learn all about this and more by watching the slides that are gonna pop up right next. So please take a look at that and it'll guide you to where you can learn about um, how to get a copy of this presentation, uh, future slide decks from other presentations, maybe this one too, Ryan, if you're willing to share the slides. Um, and then additionally, where you can get um, access to all the recordings we have in this series. So you'll see all that right now. So hold on and take a look for that. And, um, and we'll see you all soon. Till then, take care. And thanks again, Ryan. Thank you. Thank you.